Back before we received the amazing Marvel Ultimate Alliance trilogy, developer Raven Software created a different series which would form the backbone of what Marvel Ultimate Alliance would become. That series was X-Men Legends, an RPG-style game focused solely on the X-Men universe. In this video, we'll be discussing the first game, X-Men Legends 1, which released back in 2004 on GameCube, PlayStation 2, Xbox, and something called an N-Gage. This occurred during my childhood, and even I don't remember an N-Gage, but nonetheless, I'll be primarily focusing on the console version of the game for this retrospective. More specifically, all the gameplay you'll be seeing throughout this video are from the PS2 version via the PCSX2 emulator on my PC, which is how I was able to upscale the graphics a bit. I also want to point out that this video will be full of spoilers, so I'd suggest playing the game first if you're concerned about that. But with that said, let's discuss how X-Men Legends came to be in our history section. Today on RVN World News, we examine the growing mutant menace. It's a concern of worldwide proportions. This scene took place in Russia two weeks ago as a young mutant stood in defiance of the military. And in the Far East, the authorities attempted to quell an uprising at a mutant camp, but they had little success. Let's start with where Raven Software was as a company at this time. They were coming off of a game called Soldier of Fortune and mostly had experience with PC games. X-Men Legends would be their first multi-platform game, which created quite the learning curve for them. This also bolstered their development staff drastically as the team went from about 25 people on Soldier of Fortune to 90 on X-Men Legends. They decided to take a lot of inspiration from the Diablo games and originally planned for the combat to be turn-based like the Final Fantasy games before they ultimately landed on the style they have today. Raven Software was also given a lot of creative control over the game, and Marvel would just sign off on their ideas. Marvel wasn't the powerhouse company that it is today, so things were a bit different back then. Currently, Marvel is best known for its Avengers characters thanks to the MCU movies. For this reason, it may seem strange for a game series to start with a group of characters that aren't Spider-Man, Iron Man, or Captain America. In hindsight, it would almost seem to make more sense to start by creating a Marvel Ultimate Alliance game, and then spin off into something like X-Men Legends to capture mass appeal. But back in 2004, Marvel's most popular characters were much different from who they are now. Spider-Man has always been number one, but characters like Iron Man and Captain America weren't household names the way they are now. In fact, back in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, the X-Men were actually one of Marvel's most successful comic series, if not the best sellers themselves. This led to the X-Men appearing in various other forms of media outside of the comics. For example, the X-Men featured in a lot of different games prior to X-Men Legends, in titles like X-Men vs. Street Fighter, X-Men Mutant Apocalypse, X-Men Mutant Academy, and plenty more. Outside of gaming, there was also the popular 90s animated show, which helped to bring the X-Men to TV audiences, as well as to kids like myself. Then, of course, is probably the biggest reason why X-Men Legends was released, the X-Men movies. X-Men 1 released in 2000 with great financial and critical success, which led to X-2 in 2003, which seemed to be even more successful. With X-Men 1 being so popular and X-2 continuing that hype, it's not surprising that an X-Men game would be on people's minds. That being said, X-Men Legends is not a movie tie-in game, so it doesn't follow the story of the movies, although there are some minor similarities to the first one that we'll discuss later. Regardless, X-Men Legends is an original story that seems to draw inspiration primarily from the comics. In fact, during an interview with IGN, project lead Rob Gee gave some insight on where they took inspiration from in crafting their X-Men for the game, and how they leaned mostly on the comics. The X-Men and X-Men Legends are created from the diverse iterations from the comics to the movies and various cartoons. Their basic background stories and personalities come from the main run of the Uncanny X-Men comics, so their relationships and histories mesh logically together and meet the expectations for most X-Men fans that know their X-Lore. The new Ultimate X-Men comics inspired their appearance in X-Men Legends, as Marvel wanted them to have that edgy and gritty new look, which fit our needs perfectly. A few characters have yet to appear in the Ultimate Universe, so with the approval from Marvel, we created our own interpretations of how they might appear. I'm really glad that Raven Software decided to take inspiration primarily from the comics, since so many games around this time seemed to think that focusing on the movie versions was the way to go, ignoring all the decades of previously established lore that made these characters beloved in the first place. I think this was a great move, and the attention to character relationships is felt throughout the story. I believe this is in thanks to the choice to involve Marvel comic writers to pen the story. In this case, Raven Software turned to a team of former Marvel writers who call themselves Man of Action, consisting of writers Joe Casey, Joe Kelly, Steven Siegel, and Duncan R. Sorry Duncan, I can't pronounce your last name. But each of these writers seem to have had a hand in the uncanny X-Men comic run as well, and collectively bring with them a wealth of experience within X-Men lore. 
We'll talk about the plot in a minute, but the dialogue between characters and how they're portrayed feels spot on, and I give a lot of credit for that to Man of Action's writing and attention to detail for each character, something we don't always get in every Marvel game. Another interesting difference from most other X-Men games and movies is that X-Men Legends 1 doesn't focus primarily on Wolverine, and instead opts to focus on the X-Men evenly as a team. In fact, you could argue that the main character of the game is Magma, a character that is largely unknown and doesn't appear in the movies. Magma was chosen by the writers because they felt she would be a good blank slate character for the players to follow as she experiences the world of mutants. But even Magma doesn't take much of the spotlight. Speaking of the plot though, this is as good a time as any to walk through the story and discuss what we were given in our story section. We interrupt this newscast with a breaking story. A young woman named Allison Cressmere was identified as a mutant. The Genetic Research and Security Organization is now responding to that report, but a mob has formed and tempers are flaring. Girl and get out of here. Get out of my face! Come here, you! Mind if I cut in? We start the game with Wolverine attempting to stop the villains Mystique and Blob from publicly kidnapping a newly revealed mutant named Alison Cressmere, or as we'll know her later, Magma. It's unclear at this moment why Mystique and Blob want Alison in particular, but since they are part of a villain group once named the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, their intentions are surely devious. The Blob is successful in taking Alison, so we begin the game on the hunt for him while we play solo as Wolverine. I've actually seen criticism regarding this opening level due to the fact that X-Men Legends is aimed at being a cooperative, team-based experience, yet we begin with only one playable character. I think it's a valid criticism, since if your goal is to play co-op with a friend, they'll have to wait until about halfway through the level before Cyclops shows up, and it's an even longer wait if you're trying to play four-player co-op. Former members of the development team recently stated that that decision was most likely due to the challenges of incorporating a co-op tutorial at the beginning of the game, especially due to Raven being so inexperienced with co-op gameplay in general at this point. But since I was playing solo, I didn't have a problem with this. I liked being introduced to the mechanics of the game via one specific character, and I think it helped as a player to get comfortable with the basics of one character before being introduced to multiple. I know Ultimate Alliance 1 starts you off with four playable characters right out the gate, and it wasn't a problem there but I didn't mind being limited to Wolverine for this mission. This first level feels more involved than your typical tutorial mission though. You'll face plenty of enemies and you'll even have two boss fights pretty early on. You'll first be ambushed by Mystique and have to face her one-on-one -on -one with only Wolverine. After this is when you'll pick up Cyclops, who will help you to follow the giant footprint trail of Blob until you eventually confront him in this parking lot. I like this level a lot as an introduction to the game because it feels like a good tutorial, but it doesn't pull its punches. Mystique isn't easy to defeat as a first boss, especially solo, and Blob's health takes a while to chip down, primarily because he's physical resistant, meaning that Wolverine won't be much help here, so you need to focus on using Cyclops' optic blast to beat him. So early on, the game is already teaching you to be mindful of your team's strengths and weaknesses against different enemy types. This is important because it will factor into how you choose what characters to bring on a mission for your four-person squad. We'll talk more about this as we go through the video, but every X-Man has their own pros, cons, and unique abilities that could prove useful during a mission. But now that we've defeated Blob, it's time to escort Allison to the X-Jet and escape back to the X-Mansion. Once we arrive, Jean Grey introduces Allison to Professor Xavier and then gives us a tour of the mansion. It's optional to get the tour, but it's actually pretty cool to get the additional insight from Jean as you explore. I especially enjoyed her little descriptions of each character if you enter their dorm room. This is Rogue's room. You like her. She's a bit of a wild child. She tends to get into trouble? Well, Rogue did a few questionable things before joining the X-Men, but she's proven herself to be an invaluable member of our team. It's fun to hear if you're a fan of the character already, but if you're new to the X-Men, I think it's helpful in giving you information on their personality and backstory. Also within the mansion are different collectibles that you can examine, for example, prior cinematic cutscenes, comic book covers, and you can play trivia. The X-Mansion is a pretty cool hub area to explore, but it's unfortunate you can only ever explore it as Allison and not any other characters. But eventually you'll head down into the sub-basement where all the best stuff is. You can talk to Forge, a character in the comics known for being savvy with inventions. Forge is your gear vendor where you can spend credits to buy better equipment or sell some of your useless gear. You'll only ever use credits for two things, buy gear or revive fallen heroes. 
This leaves the player with an interesting dilemma of deciding to either buy better gear for their heroes, or save credits in the event that their best characters get knocked out. Reviving heroes isn't cheap, so this can be a tough choice. This is something absent from the Ultimate Alliance games, and although I don't think it's a pro or con to either game, I like how it's utilized in Legends and how it can create decision-making conflict for the player. By the way, I'll be comparing X-Men Legends 1 to Ultimate Alliance 1 often throughout this retrospective for a couple reasons. They were both made by Raven Software, and I just finished playing through Ultimate Alliance for a previous retrospective series, so it's still fresh in my mind. I know I'm going backwards, but I'm kind of enjoying seeing where things began with X-Men Legends after having experienced where it ends with Ultimate Alliance. Also, I haven't replayed X-Men Legends 2 yet, so I can't really use it for comparison right now, since I don't remember it. But anyway, the sub-basement also contains the Danger Room, which is where you can practice your skills and do some extra leveling if you feel the need. Most of the early ones focus on Allison, but there are also some team-based missions as well as character-specific missions that you can find throughout the story. So definitely a fun inclusion for fans to play through if they want to spend more time with certain characters. Lastly, we have the War Room where we'll start each mission, which brings us to the second mission, the Harp Facility. It seems the Brotherhood are attacking a government facility in Alaska, so it's our mission to find them and figure out what they're up to. We don't learn much during this mission, but I personally learned the hard way here that the game doesn't have an autosave feature, which I should have expected since it's a PS2 game, but I'm not that bright. So after replaying a couple earlier levels, I made it back to this point in the ice tunnels. I want to call this section out specifically because I feel like it's one of the harder sections in the game. You're faced with a lot of strong enemies, some of which are able to stun you, and most of them have one resistance or another, which required me to switch to specific X-Men depending on the enemy. For example, I was dependent on Wolverine to take out the energy-resistant enemies, and Cyclops to take out the physical-resistant ones. This goes back to strategic team building, since as you can see, I have three energy-based heroes and only one physical-based hero on my team. After my experience in the ice tunnels, I tried to keep a split of two physical and two energy teammates just to be safe, which I kinda liked because the game had me planning ahead for what I might encounter throughout a mission, instead of just picking whoever. I think this level also feels harder because it's earlier in the game, so one, I was still learning the ropes, and two, I hadn't had a chance to level up my characters much, so they were still limited on abilities. But we'll talk more about leveling a bit later on. Once I got my head out of my ass and started to approach the fights a little more cautiously and strategically, I was able to progress the story. We eventually reach a helipad where Toad has just been ditched by the rest of the Brotherhood. With Toad cornered, this leads us into a boss fight as we destroy the remaining jets to prevent his escape. Once defeated, we take a moment to question Toad on the Brotherhood's plan. Despite having been ditched by them three times already, Toad is surprisingly loyal, playing dumb to each of our questions. Also, one of the questions we can ask is, do you know what happens to a toad when it's thrown out of a jet at 20,000 feet? I think this is an easter egg to the line Storm says to Toad in the first movie. Do you know what happens to a toad when it's struck by lightning? The same thing that happens to everything else. Despite our threats, Toad is still being pretty useless, so we decide to take him back to the mansion as a prisoner until he's ready to talk. Back at the mansion, we once again take control of Allison. Once we head into the sub-basement, we can talk to the newly imprisoned Toad, but he's still of no help. Instead, we're better off finding Professor Xavier in the Danger Room, who puts Allison through her first Danger Room experience to gauge her powers. Even though Magma feels very powerful during this gameplay, she's a little too powerful. Huh. The kid's got potential. Indeed. Professor, the safety protocols are failing. I'm getting her out of there. Wait. Stop! 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 What just happened? Trouble? Not at all, my child. Scott? Professor, I haven't seen energy readings like this since... The Phoenix. And there it is, a reference to the Phoenix Force that inhabited Jean Grey in the comics, but not yet in the movies. This is a fun nod to the comics, but the Phoenix isn't really mentioned again outside of this scene. I think the purpose of the Phoenix name drop here is to signal to comic fans that Magma is a very powerful mutant, which will come into play later in the game. But for now, it's time for the next mission, and Professor Xavier recently received a transmission from the X-Man Gambit, who seems to be in trouble with the Morlocks, a group of mutant outcasts who live in the sewers. After hearing that Gambit is in distress, 
I like that the first character who speaks up is Rogue. Professor, the Morlocks are after Rami. We gotta go save him. I agree, Rogue. We must proceed with caution. It's not a big moment, but it's a subtle nod to the relationship that she and Gambit have in the comics, and I think it's a nice touch for fans. But with Gambit needing aid, our mission is to head into the sewers and extract Gambit without stirring up the Morlocks. But we all know that was never going to pan out, and almost immediately we run into swaths of Morlock enemies throughout the sewers, most of which also have various resistances, and like the ice tunnels, I found this to be a challenging level. Eventually we come across the Morlock leader, Mero, who isn't happy to see us on her turf. Even more concerning, she acts like she's never heard of Gambit, and states that our intel was wrong. Since she's obviously lying, we decide to continue searching. During our search, we come across the only welcoming Morlock, Healer. He'll act as another vendor that we can access throughout the game, and he specializes in health and energy potions. He can come in handy if you're in a pinch and have some credits, otherwise I never really used him. Eventually, we manage to find Gambit who is trapped in a cage. Surprise, surprise, Mero is the one holding him captive. Surprise, surprise! As you might expect, this leads to a fight against Mero. If you're not familiar with this character, she actually has some pretty creepy powers. She has control over her own bone growth, and her bones often protrude out of her skin, which she'll often break off and weaponize, so she's basically throwing her own bones at us during this fight. But after letting Wolverine take the brunt of her attacks while I blasted her with Cyclops, we eventually defeat Mero. She lets us leave with Gambit, and he informs us that he was down in these sewers to investigate rumors of the Morlocks teaming up with the Brotherhood. Not wanting to overstay our welcome, we head back to the X-Jet. Once aboard, Professor Xavier informs us that he's learned where Mystique is heading next, a ship called the USS Arbiter. Once aboard, we're immediately greeted by a Sentinel, a robot designed by humans to hunt and kill mutants. As I played through the duration of this game, I eventually became accustomed to fighting the regular enemies and didn't find them too troubling, but the Sentinels have always been difficult. They have a variety of different attacks, all of which do a ton of damage, and they're pretty durable. I surprisingly like that though, because Sentinels of all enemies should feel the deadliest, since they're so fearsome in the comics, and they certainly feel that way here. But as we fight our way through the ship, we eventually come across Blob, and we learn that the Brotherhood stole a masking device to make their biometrics look human, essentially making them invisible to these Sentinels. We don't have that luxury though, so we'll spend the rest of this level fighting Sentinels and regular soldiers. Eventually, Jean telepathically informs us that Blob has destroyed the generators on the ship, meaning that it's going to sink before too long. This leads to a time mission where we have to find different crew members and save them from the sinking ship. Although I typically hate time trials in games, you're given 15 minutes which felt like enough time, even though it was kind of down to the wire for me. One detail I liked was that the ship would occasionally spring leaks. If you have an X-Men on your team who can weld the hole shut, you'll get time added back onto the timer, which feels thematic in that you've bought yourself more time by taking the burden off of Jean Grey who was attempting to seal the leaks using her powers. The timer ended up being down to the wire for me because I got lost a lot during this mission and I wasn't able to seal the final two leaks since my Cyclops was defeated, so it was mostly my fault. But while we were preoccupied saving the crew members, Blob was wreaking havoc while Mystique snuck into a sealed room. I don't know why we get this long and unnecessary ass shot of Mystique, but it leads into the reveal that Magneto has been kept prisoner on the ship and the whole purpose of this break-in was to free him. Now free, Magneto wastes no time in hijacking a news broadcast in an attempt to rally mutants to his cause. Homo sapiens, we stand upon the edge of a brave new world, and evolution has found you lacking. I invite all mutants to congregate at the mount. Together we will force the Homo sapiens to make way for their true masters. Homo sapiens. We cut back to the X-Mansion, where we can take a breather as Allison before jumping into the next mission. During this section, I went back through the characters' rooms and noticed there were little details I missed that gave more insight into the characters' personalities. 
For example, a painting that Colossus is working on, something he does in the comics, a photo of a rose in Jean's room with a cringy line from Scott saying, our love will bloom forever, and there's an even better Easter egg in Wolverine's room where he has a Canadian flag with different signatures on it from members of the Alpha Flight. The Alpha Flight are a Canadian superhero team in the comics, and Wolverine was at one time part of it, since he is in fact Canadian. So yeah, a pretty fun Easter egg for Wolverine here. But as for our next mission, the Brotherhood is broken into a nuclear power plant. While we were searching for the Brotherhood, we find Colossus who has been holding up a regulator to prevent the whole facility from going into a meltdown. Once we save the facility and free Colossus, he informs us that Magneto is planning to use gravitic ions as part of his plans. I don't know what the hell those are, but they'll come into play towards the end of the game. For Colossus to join our team though, he requests that his sister Ileana be taken to Muir Island for medical treatment since she has recently fallen into a coma. If the name Ileana rings a bell for you, it could be from the recent New Mutants movie that finally released, where Ileana is one of the main characters. In the comics, Ileana Rasputin becomes the mutant character Magic, and this mysterious coma that she's fallen into could be a nod to her origin in the comics, in which she is transported to the dimension of Limbo. Although she spent years in Limbo in the comics, when she eventually returns, only moments have passed in the real world. However, the game changes things up a bit by having her mind trapped in the astral plane, a mission we'll discuss shortly. But at the moment, the X-Men have no idea what's wrong with her, so they are rightfully concerned. In the meantime, Forge creates a life support device to keep Ileana alive. With things seemingly under control for now, we return back to the X-Mansion. As we head through the mansion, we are intercepted by Emma Frost, who takes a moment to introduce herself. Almost on cue, Charles pops in like a ghost, meant to symbolize his ability to communicate telepathically. Charles, my sweet. You're looking more handsome every day. And you, Emma, are equal parts beauty and chaos. Such a smooth talker. You could charm a girl right out of her. Thank you for coming to the mansion so promptly. I am in dire need of your talents. Yes, get it, Charles. But anyway, it seems that the purpose for Emma's arrival is because Charles needs another telepath for a mission, which is one of Emma Frost's abilities, along with being able to turn her skin into diamond. For our next mission, it seems that cloaked intruders have invaded the mansion. Jean Grey is able to locate them and we swiftly kick them out, but not before taking some of their gear. Beast is able to reconfigure their devices and find out who the soldiers were communicating with, and it turns out that the signal came from the Canadian facility where the Weapon X program was held, the same one that grafted the metal onto Wolverine's bones. Naturally, Wolverine heads there immediately. But unbeknownst to everyone, Cyclops is heading there too. Earlier on Muir Island, we walk in on Cyclops telecommunicating with his brother, Havoc, who is part of the Brotherhood. It seems that Havoc wants Cyclops to see something at this old Weapon X facility. This leads to a mini solo mission as Cyclops as we meet up with Havoc. Havoc hopes that once Cyclops gets a moment to witness the atrocities of what was once Weapon X, he'll be more inclined to join the Brotherhood. Instead, Cyclops gets pissed off, and we have a one-on-one -on -one fight between the brothers. Wolverine eventually shows up and breaks up the fight, and together we all decide to explore the facility. After beating up a bunch of soldiers, we randomly happen upon an astral gate, which would allow non-psychic people to enter the astral plane. This sounds handy, so we decide to take it. While we attempt to leave, we find a Morlock prisoner who mentions that General Kincaid is the one running this facility, which means he's someone we need to track down. Of course, Havoc refuses to join us, and instead chooses to return to Magneto. Meanwhile, Professor Xavier reveals that they believe Ileana's mind is trapped in the astral plane, which is why he called for Emma Frost's help. Together, Charles, Emma, and Jean enter the astral plane in an attempt to free Ileana. By the way, this level in particular might be my favorite. Even though it appears really simplistic, it's incredibly unique compared to the other levels. It's also really mysterious and otherworldly. You even get to play as Professor Xavier for a while, which is really enjoyable because he's already fully maxed out, so you feel like you're controlling a real powerhouse. As you should, since Xavier is considered to be the strongest telepath. By the way, if you're confused as to why Xavier is walking all of a sudden, it's because the astral plane is a mental landscape, so these are just projections of their mind, essentially. But as we're hunting for Ileana, we're interrupted by the Shadow King. Quickly, that portal will take you to Ileana. We're not leaving without you, Professor. Don't be a fool, girl. We must escape. Get out! Show yourself, Shadow King. I know it's you. Hello, Xavier. I'm impressed you remember me. I'd never forget the true face of evil. <laughs> I have to give him credit. The brat Ileana served her purpose. 
Give who credit? Someone told you to kidnap Ilyana? No one would dare give an order to Shadow King. I was advised that stealing the child would lure you into my world. And here you are. What do you intend to do now? I should have thought it obvious, Xavier. I will have my revenge. <laughs> <laughs> After all that praise I just gave Charles for being such a powerhouse, he gets taken down real easy by this astral demon. But this is the last we see of Charles for a bit, as the game turns its attentions towards Jean and Emma, who are able to find Ileana and return her home. With all the X-Men back at the mansion, Jean and Emma fill in the others on Xavier's capture. Of course, this also happens to be the exact moment that Magneto shows up on their lawn requesting a word with Charles. Since Charles is incapacitated, a group of X-Men speak to Magneto instead. Magneto offers them a chance to join in his upcoming war, but the X-Men of course refuse. Magneto also frees Toad from our captivity, and reveals that he has restored his headquarters on Asteroid M, which is pretty much what it sounds like, a headquarters on an asteroid. But in the middle of our conversation, a swarm of sentinels arrive. Oh yeah, just five left! <laughs> Wolverine! Cease all mutants. You see? Violence is all humanity has to offer us. Doesn't he ever shut up? Look! No! We need to regroup! While we wait to learn more about Magneto's potential whereabouts, Beast was able to pinpoint the location of Asteroid M. But since we can't just fly there, we have to find another means to reach it. Luckily, Gambit informs us that we can do so via the Morlocks, which means we're going right back to these sewers again. I'll be honest, this is not my favorite level, but at least these enemies are much easier to fight now since we've leveled up a lot since our last visit. But after fighting through a bunch of Morlocks again, we eventually find a mutant named Gateway, who the Brotherhood are using to transport people to Asteroid M, or at least part of the way there. When we step through Gateway's portal, we end up at the Equator and decide to investigate. Through our exploration, we come across Brotherhood members Sabretooth and Avalanche, who spill the beans that this location is where they transport people all the way to Asteroid M. We attempt to fight our way to the teleporter, but through the chaos, Sabretooth and Avalanche escape right into it, right before it falls into lava, ruining our chances of reaching Asteroid M. With no other options, we decide to return back to the mansion once again. This brings us to a cutscene of General Kincaid giving an anti-mutant speech. There is no negotiating with the mutant blight. Ladies and gentlemen, I offer you a way to eradicate it before they- Silence, human! Your plans to destroy mutant kind will not come to fruition. This pitiful attempt failed, but it has sealed your fate. Let your followers know that it was you who set this war in motion, and let their anguished cries keep you warm in the, in the days, days to come. come. and said, let there be darkness. You set these events in motion the first time you laid hands on one of us. You have always looked down upon mutants, feared us, hated us. And now you shall reap what you have sown. The decision is yours. Will a new day dawn where my children will no longer hide in fear? 
War will it be forever night. With the planet covered in asteroids, the world is in panic, which has led to many different issues. The first of which are the Morlocks, who are being invaded by soldiers. So you know what that means, we have to go to my least favorite level for a third time and fight through waves of enemies. The level even culminates with a boss fight against Mero again. But once we defeat Mero and convince her that she was wrong to side with the Brotherhood, it's on to the next mission, which are the Riots. Not only are there a ton of rioters in the streets, but there are also a ton of Sentinels attempting to hurt innocent people. This mission is essentially just us clearing the streets of Sentinels, but that's easier said than done. Even though I felt I had a pretty solid team at this point and was fairly leveled up, these Sentinels were still cutting through my team, and I had to make multiple trips back to the extraction points to swap them out. These Sentinels are no joke, and again, I don't think that's bad at all, it's definitely a fun challenge. The developers even up the ante by making you fight two at a time now instead of just one. I only barely beat this level thanks to Rogue and her extremely powerful punch. So I hope for Gambit's sake he never speaks out of line. We also get another fun easter egg during this mission where we save a young child named Bishop. This child will later become the X-Man Bishop, a character who does a lot of time hopping and has the ability to absorb all forms of energy. I believe Gateway is even a relative of his. Along the way, we also pick up Psylocke as a new playable character from here on out, so this mission was pretty eventful. But with the Sentinels defeated, we turn to the last in our trio of missions, the Juggernaut boss fight. The Juggernaut has invaded Mirror Island in hopes of getting his hands on Forge. If you're unfamiliar with Juggernaut, he's actually not a mutant. He gained his powers through the mystical Crimson Gem of Sidorak, which makes him an unstoppable Juggernaut, meaning that he can't be stopped once he's in motion. That's why he has this mystical emblem beneath him while he's running during the fight. He's not too tough here though, you pretty much just wait for him to stop running and then spam him with attacks. Once defeated, Forge throws him in a special containment cell and they remove his helmet. His helmet is like Magneto's in that it can block telepaths from reading his mind. With his helmet off now, Jean questions him telepathically and learns that he was hired from an anonymous source to destroy the Astral Gate, which he assumed was in Forge's possession. It wasn't, so this was all for naught. Now back at the mansion, we fire up the Astral Gate and attempt to bring Xavier home. We can't just walk right into Xavier's prison though, first we have to defeat three astral creations of our enemies. Dark Pyro, Dark Avalanche, and BDSM Blob. Ugh. After defeating them, we are able to find Xavier who is under the manipulation of Shadow King. Xavier believes he is the Emperor and requests entertainment in his Colosseum. He chooses to send his gladiators after us once Shadow King suggests that we might be assassins. But after defeating his champions, Xavier suddenly starts to snap out of it. Realizing he's losing the Professor, Shadow King teleports them away again. With no way of tracking them, we return back to the X-Mansion. In the meantime, we take on a different mission in which we need to get Sentinel hardware from the Gerso military facility. Remember how Magneto was captured a while back by a group of Sentinels? Well, it seems that this is where he was taken. However, it looks like Magneto eventually woke up, defeated the Sentinels, and escaped the facility, presumably heading back to Asteroid M. It's not entirely clear why we need the Sentinel hardware from the facility at this time, but it's mentioned later on that the hardware can be used on the X-Jet to help us reach Asteroid M. But once we find the necessary hardware, we're almost ready to leave, right before we come across a new type of Sentinel called the Sentinel Advanced. When we investigate the basement, we find a pretty grisly workshop, suggesting that these new Sentinels are human hybrids with cybernetic parts, under the control of General Kincaid. I believe these are based on the Prime Sentinel in the comics, who operate in a similar way. By the way, I vaguely mentioned General Kincaid a couple times now. He's an original character made for this game, but he's kind of a mirror of William Stryker, if that helps to clear up his motivations. They both experiment on mutants and are willing to do anything to exterminate the mutant race. We also learned during this level that Kincaid was the one who ordered the construction of the Astral Gate, and Storm hypothesizes that he could have been the one who suggested that Shadow King steal Ileana in order to capture Xavier. Sounds like a lot of work to go through just to get Xavier, but he is the most powerful mutant, so I guess you have to get creative. But as we move through the facility, we find that the mutant gateway has been captured. Once we free him, General Kincaid randomly shows up too. We chase after him, but he destroys our path. With gateway coincidentally in the same area, he makes us teleport to continue our pursuit. But as you'd expect, we just run into another barrier, and without gateway to help us, we return back to the mansion. By the way, you might be thinking, why not have Nightcrawler just teleport you past the barrier, which was certainly my first thought as well, but Nightcrawler has to be able to see where he's teleporting, or else he might end up stuck inside a wall, so he's not really able to help us here. Back at the mansion, the X-Men feel they can't delay rescuing Xavier any longer, so they decide to return back to the Astral Plane once again. This time, we legitimately find Xavier's mental prison and free him. What? You've escaped? Now you will die! 
die, Xavier! I'm no longer helpless, Shadow King. And I am a force to be reckoned with here on the Astral Plane. Your power is childlike compared to that of Shadow King. I will have my revenge! This results in a Astral Colosseum battle between Shadow King and Xavier dressed as a gladiator. I'm honestly not sure why they turned into gladiators. If this is a nod to something from the comics, I couldn't find it. But if you know, I'd love to hear why in the comments below. Regardless, I admire the uniqueness of the fight and it's certainly memorable. I found it to be a somewhat tough fight, but I think that was mostly due to me not understanding Xavier's abilities yet, since they are slightly different from his normal attacks from the first Astral level. But even then, I didn't have a lot of time with him in that level either, but nonetheless, we beat Shadow King and free Xavier. With Xavier home, the X-Men decide that they can't wait any longer to breach Asteroid M. Beast was able to modify the X-Jet using the stolen Sentinel parts, so we're finally ready to go. Also, we get this brief cutscene for Asteroid M, and I don't know why, but it makes me laugh every time. There's just something about the sudden zoom in, I don't know. But now that we've made it into the asteroid, we need to find a way in. Luckily, Emma Frost is able to telepathically control Toad, who lets us right in. I'll knock you bloody bunch of do-gooders again! As we move through the base, we come across Mystique, who reveals her original evil plan and why she attempted to kidnap Magma during the first level. Due to Magma's ability to control rock, Mystique figured she was the natural choice to encapsulate the Earth in asteroids the way Magneto wanted. I think this is kind of similar to the way Rogue was used in the first X-Men film, since Magneto needed her abilities and she was kind of a secret main character to the plot of the story. Although in the game, Mystique only wanted Magma as backup in case she wasn't able to free Magneto, so Magma wasn't even necessary for her plot. Instead, Magneto did it himself using a Gravitron device to move the asteroids. But more on this development later. Continuing through the base, we finally find Magneto. He makes one last attempt to recruit us into the Brotherhood, but once we refuse, it's boss fight time. He's a pretty decent boss fight and different members of the Brotherhood will also jump in, but ultimately he's not as tough as you'd expect. That's probably because he's not even the final boss, since the game continues as Sentinels start to swarm the asteroid. Even worse, Asteroid M starts to fall, heading towards New York. But Magma realizes that she can save everyone by controlling the Gravitron device, so that's where we head next. Once in the room, a mysterious sentinel emerges, piloted by none other than General Kincaid. Maybe I missed something in the story, but I'm not sure how Kincaid was able to keep the Master Mold Sentinel housed in Magneto's base and then use it at this moment. Regardless, I'm going with it because it leads to a pretty cool boss fight against Master Mold, another character from the comics. Master Mold is legitimately our last boss fight, and after beating him, Magma is free to use the Gravitron device. Kid, the Gravitron was built for Magneto. It could kill you. That's a chance I'll have to take. Time to heat things up. Whatever you're doing, it's working! Stopping Asteroid M, you not only saved New York City, but you prevented a war. A war that would have cost countless lives. Your unwavering courage in the face of overwhelming odds has proven that you truly are an X-Man. For X-Men are the stuff of legend. Enjoy your small victory, Xavier, for the Age of Apocalypse is nigh. 
<laughs> and yes, we get this awesome cliffhanger hinting at Apocalypse for the next game. Raven Software seemed to like providing cliffhangers for future bosses, since they did the same thing in Marvel Ultimate Alliance 1 when they teased Galactus. Unfortunately, Raven didn't get to make the sequel to that game, so we never got the Galactus story, but luckily they did make X-Men Legends 2. So expect that retrospective before too long and get ready for Apocalypse. By the way, Apocalypse seemed to suggest here that he was hoping that Xavier would fail so he could presumably take over a weakened Earth. Earlier, Storm speculated that Kincaid was the one who manipulated Shadow King into taking Xavier, but maybe it was in fact Apocalypse. Again, I haven't replayed the sequel yet, so I don't recall its story, but I'm sure we'll have plenty to discuss in that video. But at the end of this game, we get a final news broadcast basically letting us know that Magneto is still at large, Kincaid has been taken into custody, and the president is willing to try and allow humans and mutants to exist peacefully. But that's the story of X-Men Legends 1. For beating the game, we're given alternate costumes for each character, and they're all pretty cool. I think I like how Ultimate Alliance lets you unlock outfits one by one through different challenges instead of just giving them all to you at once, but I was glad to see alternate outfits in the game at all. As far as the story overall, it's okay. I feel like there are a lot of contrivances and filler throughout the game, and some of the twists didn't quite hit me the way I hoped they would. For example, I like that the story begins with the mystery of why the Brotherhood want Allison specifically, but it falls flat when Mystique reveals that she only wanted Allison as a backup, meaning that Allison wasn't even necessary to their plan. It's not that it doesn't feel plausible, in fact Mystique has taken leadership of the Brotherhood in Magneto's absence before, so I can understand her wanting a backup plan, but why not try to take Allison after failing to free Magneto? I don't know, but my point is that the whole opening of Allison being targeted by the Brotherhood feels more contrived than purposeful, and I think it would have worked better for me if Allison had been essential to the Brotherhood's plans, similar to how Rogue was essential to their plans in the movie. Cyclops seems to agree. We don't know. But you must have been a very important piece of the plan for Mystique to attempt to kidnap you in broad daylight. Magneto's use in the story feels kind of underwhelming too. He almost felt like a red herring of sorts to hide the true villain of the game, General Kincaid. But Magneto looms so large throughout the story that I was much more invested in his story arc and I wasn't at all interested in General Kincaid. When Mystique first frees Magneto from the Arbiter, it's a big moment and I remember feeling nervous about what he might do now that he's escaped. As the story continues, we slowly see him build up followers and set up his asteroid plan, and he feels like a major threat. But then he's taken down so easily on Asteroid M, and his story is just done, and the shift focuses to General Kincaid piloting the Master Mold. I don't even really understand how he got there. Maybe there's something in the story that I overlooked or a file that I missed, but my point is that it doesn't feel impactful. In fact, I feel like you could have cut Kincaid from this ending and it wouldn't be noticeable. Make Magneto a tougher boss fight and the final boss, and then have us head to the Gravitron controls for Magma to save the day. Regardless, I did enjoy the Master Mold fight, and it felt like it was a climactic battle, I guess I just wish it connected with me more. I also felt like the story had a lot of filler missions to pad out the runtime, and some missions felt unnecessary to the plot. Like I discussed earlier, we visit the Morlock sewer three times in the story, and the third time pretty closely mirrors the first time where we fight through the Morlocks and then defeat Marrow. The same goes for all of Magma's Danger Room missions, I think one would have been enough. As much as I liked the Juggernaut fight, that wasn't really necessary either, since he had the wrong location. He probably could have been used during a different mission to the same effect. I don't want to dog the story too much, because in the Ultimate Alliance retrospectives I mentioned that the story is mostly there as a reason to take us from location to location in the Marvel Universe, and I think the same applies to X-Men Legends. So the story doesn't need to be groundbreaking by any means. Some of my issue might even have to do with the level design. If I was more impressed with the levels themselves, this may not have been a problem. For example, I didn't mind returning to the Astral Plane three times because it was so unique and there was something new added each time, but the rest of the locations that we visit do kind of blur together. If I had to pick my favorite locations of the game, they would be the Astral Plane, Asteroid M, and even just exploring the X-Mansion. I think I liked these so much because they were more unique and notable areas within the Marvel Universe. I know the Morlock Tunnels are too, but the sewers just aren't that interesting. As for the rest of the locations, they just kind of feel like different facilities without much substance. But I know this is a game from the early 2000s and Raven Software were new to console development, so I don't want to be too hard on it, but these are the issues I experienced while playing. However, there are aspects that I really like about the story. The first is that I appreciate the decision to make the main character a new recruit, in this case Magma. I like how she's a window into the universe for us as the player, so we can essentially experience the world through her eyes. I always see a lot of complaints regarding other X-Men games and movies because the focus is always on Wolverine, so I think shifting that focus in Legends was a nice touch, and I like that the focus as a whole was balanced around the team. 
I also like how accurately represented the X-Men are in the game. I get a sense for all of their pre-existing relationships and prior stories from the comics. Two examples I mentioned earlier were how Rogue was concerned for Gambit's well-being and the way the Phoenix was name-dropped after Magma's Danger Room session. There are plenty more throughout the game, but they're nice nods for fans of the series and don't disrupt the flow of the story or leave new fans out in the cold. So the more you know about the X-Men, the more rewarded you'll feel as you spot these nods throughout the game. I also got the sense that everyone involved with creating X-Men Legends were fans in some way, and you can feel that passion throughout the game, not just in the story, but in the world, the collectibles, and even the combat, which we'll get to shortly. Another cool addition to the story are flashback missions, which are very easily missable. In fact, I missed them during my first playthrough and had to go back to try them. You trigger these optional missions by talking to specific characters at certain parts of the story in the X-Mansion. For example, Nightcrawler walks us through a time when they had to stop a bunch of Sentinels, and Beast describes the time that Juggernaut was crashing through the X-Mansion in search of the Professor. I actually love this Juggernaut fight a lot more than the one on Mirror Island, because you have to stop Juggernaut from wrecking the mansion and finding Xavier, and it's a lot more thematic with him smashing into every room. Probably the most iconic flashback mission, though, is the one where you play as Wolverine breaking out of the Weapon X facility. The inclusion of these flashback missions are really cool, and if you happen to run across one without knowing it, I'm sure you'd be in for quite the surprise. I know I just complained about the story having filler, but I like the addition of these flashback missions since they are optional, and they're there as a reward for the player who is engaging with the story more, since you'd have to be seeking out dialogue with different characters in the X-Mansion to trigger it. Also, while we're on the topic of stories, if you're looking for additional X-Men storylines to listen to, I'd recommend trying out Amazon Audible. I've been using Audible myself for about a year now, exclusively for their Marvel content, and I've been really enjoying it. Since I've been on such a big X-Men kick while making this retrospective, I recently listened to Days of Future Past and was surprised at how well it was recreated. It was also incredibly immersive due to the inclusion of music, sound effects, and each character having their own voice actor, instead of just a deadpan reading of the story. I'll leave a link in the description for a free trial if you'd like to check it out, and if you do try it out, I'd recommend looking for stories that have full cast listed in the credits, since those are the ones that have the immersive sound effects and voice acting. But anyway, as far as this retrospective, I should briefly discuss some of the visuals in the game. I'm glad to see the CG cutscenes that I love so much in Ultimate Alliance utilized in Legends. Even though they haven't quite gotten it perfected yet, I really enjoyed watching each one play out. At times, the uncanny valley of it was a little distracting. For example, any time Magneto would interrupt a news broadcast, I was more distracted by how his face and mouth looked instead of paying attention to what he had to say. Still, the cutscenes are not bad by any means, and I'm really glad the decision was made to include them. Like most things in X-Men Legends, I enjoy seeing how they started here and evolved into Ultimate Alliance. Needless to say, I'm really excited to see how they look in X-Men Legends too. I also want to call out how cool the load screens are. During a load screen, you'll see artwork of one of the characters you have on your team, as well as some of the bosses right before you face them. A lot of this artwork looks incredible and worthy of being a computer background. I think my favorite one has to be Magneto though. They did a great job of making him look really powerful and menacing. I also got some alternate outfit load screens for Jean and Logan during the Sentinel flashback, and they're amongst my favorites as well. I think everyone has a great load screen though, so I just wanted to take a moment and show them off. But I think that's enough about the story and visuals for now, so let's get into the combat and gameplay. This isn't working out the way you promised. Don't be so naive, Havoc. How could we ever hope to live peacefully with a species that regards us as abominations? But using this Gravitron of yours is... is... is madness. Then let madness be the mother of change. No! I won't let you do this! <laughs> like with Ultimate Alliance, even if the story isn't 100% engaging, it doesn't matter because the combat is where the game really shines. The same applies here for X-Men Legends 1, and it's clear from the get-go that Raven Software have developed a winning formula for the series, which is probably why it plays so similar to Ultimate Alliance 1. They got so much right here the first time that there's not really any reason to change it. However, I did notice some difference from the Ultimate Alliance games, some of which I think I like more in X-Men Legends, namely the basic attack combos. If you haven't played Ultimate Alliance 1, you can perform 3-hit, light and heavy attack combinations which have different effects on enemies, for example, tripping them or stunning them. That's still here in X-Men Legends, but where Ultimate Alliance maxed out at a 3-button combo, Legends will let you get as much as a 6-hit combo. I was actually surprised they didn't utilize this in the Ultimate Alliance games. In my opinion, this would have been a cool feature to continue forward. It felt rewarding to trigger a 6-hit combo, and I also found a new favorite combo in the game, where you can pop up an enemy and then spike them down, another omission from Ultimate Alliance. The inability to spike enemies in that game makes sense, though, because they changed the spiking animation into a charged ground slam. 
I don't necessarily think one is better than the other, I like both in their own right, but it's still cool to see what Raven decided to change over the course of the series. After playing Ultimate Alliance 1 first and then returning into X-Men Legends, there were a couple features I noticed hadn't been implemented from the beginning. One aspect was that you can't grab enemies and punch them repeatedly like you can in Ultimate Alliance. In Legends, you can only throw them to the side. Not a big deal, but I'm glad they added that in future games. There also isn't a dedicated button for blocking or evading, and instead your defense is mostly wrapped up in different abilities and stats for the character. I do want to emphasize that I'm not criticizing Legends for not having these features in the first place, since future games should always be improving upon their predecessor, but playing these games in the reverse order like I have makes them noticeable. What I'm wanting to showcase is how much the combat has evolved since Legends 1, and it's clear that Raven Software has always been making improvements on what they had done before. Moving on to the characters, X-Men Legends gives us 15 total playable characters, and although that's a pretty small roster in today's terms, we still get an interesting variety of both popular and lesser known characters. If you've ever wondered how each character was selected for the game, project lead Rob Gee actually answered this during an interview with Superhero Hype. Here's the quote. The character choices were based on a number of factors, including character popularity with the fans, mutant powers and their potential effect on the gameplay, visual elements in the story, and personal favorites of the team members. Other characters have never really gotten their due in games to this point, and we felt they deserved a chance to shine. Even with a smaller roster, Raven Software does a lot with each character to make them stand out and feel unique, which brings me to their abilities. Each X-Man has specific abilities and buffs that you can improve based around that character's specific powers and qualities. Each hero only has four abilities, but I liked how each one had different phases, some of which were noticeable improvements to an ability instead of just a slight damage boost. One of my favorites is Storm's Lightning Strike, where she calls lightning to strike one enemy. Once you've put enough ability points into it, the next phase is Chain Lightning, which means that her lightning strike will now arc out to nearby enemies as well. I love this feature and I think it adds a lot of variety to the abilities. Underneath the four core abilities are different buffs you can choose for your hero, like better critical hit chance or defense, but again they're used in ways that are unique to the character. For example, you can add lightning damage to Storm's melee attacks and give her a leadership bonus since she's led the X-Men before. Cyclops has the same leadership ability, but non-leadership characters don't. Nightcrawler has a unique ability where he has a chance to bring a downed character back to life if he's in close proximity, and you can level up Wolverine's healing factor since he's the only one in the game who has the ability to heal naturally. The list goes on, but I love the attention to detail that Raven put into each hero to really differentiate them. Each member of the X-Men brings something different to the table in the comics, so I like seeing that showcased in Legends. I think that goes back to the core concept that Raven Software wanted players to feel in the game. Teamwork. X-Men Legends is extremely team-oriented, and the unique abilities of each hero make that apparent. Whenever I would set up my team before a mission, I would often try to think of what problems I might encounter during a mission, and what heroes might help to solve those problems. For example, you'll often come across inaccessible areas that you need to traverse, and characters like Iceman and Jean Grey can make bridges. Sometimes crafting these bridges are mandatory for progressing the story, so I made sure to always have one of them on my team if I could. I typically used Iceman because his ice beams can freeze enemies and put out fires too. There's also an abundance of enemies who are either physical, energy, or mental resistant, so I made sure to always have a high damage physical and energy character on the team. I also liked including a leadership character since that buff is so good. But my point being that I felt like I was strategizing a mission the way Cyclops would to try and assemble the most effective team that I could. The necessity of different characters throughout the game also had me switching between them throughout missions and trying new tactics. I didn't get a chance to play X-Men Legends cooperatively with a friend, but I have to imagine that it's a blast to do so. I think this game lends itself very nicely to couch co-op, where you and a friend can talk through the fights and use your character's specific powers to assist each other. Raven Software felt this way too, since they decided not to include an online multiplayer feature because they wanted players to experience it in a couch co-op environment. I think fans would have appreciated the option to play online multiplayer, but I can understand the decision. There's a lot of customization with your hero's playstyle as well. Since you level pretty frequently and there are so many areas where you can spend your points, you're given a lot of flexibility with how you can build your X-Men. In the abilities section, you can try to keep everything even or bump up some of your favorite powers or load your hero with a ton of damage buffs to make them a powerhouse. The latter is the route I typically went and it didn't seem to affect me negatively. You can also balance a hero's basic stats however you like and that can make a lot of difference in playstyle as well. I also found it interesting that you can set how you want your AI teammates to act during a fight. You can set them to normal, defensive, or aggressive. I ended up setting Wolverine to aggressive because I built him as a scrapper, and I enjoyed watching my AI Wolverine jump into every fight head first, which I felt was thematic with the character. 
You can also decide when the AI can heal itself, which is important if you're worried about conserving your health potions. Set this too high and your AI might deplete your potions very quickly, or set it to the lowest option and manually control their health potion consumption yourself. I usually had it at 20% health, just so I didn't have to worry about them dying, but also not using up too much health. I guess that's a good segue into potions and gear, as well as the vendors. As you beat enemies, there's a chance they might drop gear for you to equip onto your heroes. Some are pretty basic gear improvements like increased health or damage, but some are more specified and rare. During my playthrough, I noticed that the offensive gear dropped way more frequently than the other types, and that the rare gear wasn't always that helpful. There was also a very low amount of gear variety, so you're often picking up the same stuff. You can of course visit Forge, who is your gear vendor, but he didn't really have anything unique that I wasn't finding on the ground anyway. What I really wanted was character-specific gear, but there is only one piece of character-specific gear for each hero, and you'll have to beat that character's Danger Room simulation to unlock it. Speaking of the Danger Room, you can find discs hidden around the various levels throughout the story which unlock them in the Danger Room. Playing these discs are good for learning the ropes and also leveling your characters up if you're having trouble on a particular mission. If you've played Ultimate Alliance 1 or watched my retrospective on it, the Danger Room discs are very similar to the Simulator discs in that game. The main difference is that in Ultimate Alliance, the character-specific discs give you much more backstory on a hero and have you run through a level like it's a flashback. In Legends, it's pretty much just a normal trial that you're running solo. They're still enjoyable, just not as in-depth as they'll eventually evolve into for Ultimate Alliance. Again, I'm not stating that as a criticism on Legends, a game series should evolve over time, I'm just putting it into context if you're only familiar with Ultimate Alliance. The criticism that I do have for the Danger Room, though, is that your collectibles don't carry over into new games like the unlockable outfits do. During my playthrough, I collected discs, but I wanted to focus on the Danger Room after beating the story. This clearly isn't the way the game intended for me to play, because I wasn't able to do so. After beating Master Mold and reloading my save, I found that the extraction point I saved at didn't include a way back to the Danger Room, and there was no way to backtrack. Upon starting a new game, I could now go into the Danger Room, but all the discs I had found in my previous playthrough were erased so I had to replay through some of the story just to try out a couple discs for this video. That was a real bummer because I wanted to get the full experience of the Danger Room, but I didn't have the time to retread the story in an attempt to piece them together. Even though I wasn't able to experience them all for this playthrough, I do like how hunting for discs is mitigated through the healer vendor. If you've missed a disc, it will eventually be purchasable in his shop, or you can try your hand at his grab bag, which has a small chance of gifting one of the discs. But as far as the healer shop in general, I didn't find him to be too useful since potions dropped pretty frequently. There's also a danger room option in the main menu, but it surprisingly doesn't include the hidden discs. It only includes a battle mode, but it's actually pretty cool so I'm not hating. Here you can test your skills against an AI opponent or one controlled by a friend. Even better is that some of the villains in the game are included as playable characters, so this is the only mode in X-Men Legends 1 where you have the opportunity to play as Magneto or Juggernaut, for example. It's pretty cool just for some casual fun, but that's pretty much the extent of it. Overall, I think the combat is incredibly enjoyable in X-Men Legends, and even though it has evolved over the next couple games, I think it's really solid here and it's clear Raven Software got it right from the beginning. I think the combat is where the game shines the most, as well as how it really nails the feeling of teamwork and team building. During my playthrough, those were the aspects that I enjoyed the most in X-Men Legends. But now that we've focused a lot on the visuals and the gameplay, let's discuss the audio. Let's start with the music. The music of X-Men Legends is a lot more subtle and atmospheric compared to the Ultimate Alliance tracks. That's not a bad thing, you just won't find as many bangers in the X-Men Legends soundtrack. As I was re-listening to some of the songs from the game, I was surprised to find how much I liked some of the slower, more ambient tracks compared to the faster paced ones. But I want to showcase a blend of the two here, since the music of X-Men Legends works whether you just want to chill and take in the scenery, or rock out while busting some Danger Room robots. So I'll play two of the slower tracks I liked best, and two of the faster tempo ones, and hopefully YouTube won't mind too much. Here's a nice and relaxing one from the USS Arbiter mission. It's
It's hard to explain why I like that one so much, but it's just so calm and relaxing. But if you're still awake with me, here's a more upbeat track from the nuclear power plant that I think does a great job capturing the feel of X-Men Legends. Mellowing back down a bit, here's another atmospheric track, this time from the Sentinel Lab. And to finish off the music on a more energetic note, the final track I want to show off is from one of the Magma Danger Room missions. I think those four captured most of what I enjoyed from the X-Men Legends 1 soundtrack, and I love how you get some nice atmospheric music while you're strolling through a mission, and then some of these faster paced tracks kick in when you engage an enemy. They're fun to transition between, and I ultimately really like the music throughout X-Men Legends 1. The sound effects are really good too. Most of them are subtle as well, but they really make a difference. For example, Nightcrawler's bamf as he teleports is really satisfying. Also, Wolverine's claws start to level retracted, but then when he spots an enemy, you get that sleek sound effect as he pops them out. I also really like the sound effects for the punches and kicks, and when they connect, they sound really impactful, especially when you roundhouse kick someone. Think you're bad, beauty. I also want to take a moment and discuss the voice acting. Overall, the voices in the game are hit or miss. We do get some really noteworthy performances though, for example, Patrick Stewart, the actor who plays Xavier in the movies, provided the voice for Charles in the game. Show yourself, Shadow King. I know it's you. Hello, Xavier. I'm really grateful that Patrick Stewart was willing to voice Xavier, mostly due to how iconic he is to the character, but also because he's the only actor from the movies voicing their hero. This isn't a movie tie-in game, so it's not necessary to have the actors voice the character, but it's still a nice touch. We also have Steve Blum as Wolverine, which is noteworthy because he's the only actor to voice the same character throughout both X-Men Legends games, as well as the three Ultimate Alliance games. Blum plays an amazing Wolverine and has become the voice I hear for Logan when I read the comics, so I was really glad to see he was voicing Wolverine in this game, and I hope he continues to do so in future games. Freeze, beauty! Hey bub, you should've called in sick today. The rest of the cast fit pretty good for the most part. There are some that feel a little off the mark, for example, Gambit. I heard the Morlocks talking just voting at me, and that space rock ain't the mount. Uh-uh. The mount's here on Earth. I bet that'd be the only way to transport to Magneto's base. Uh -huh. Also, I'm not sure if the news reporter is doing a good job or bad job. She sounds really robotic, but I'm not sure if that's the point, since news anchors are often kind of like that. But she really stood out. Mutant leader Magneto is still at large, but his long silence has led many to speculate he has discontinued all terrorist activities. I also struggled a little bit with Magma, not because the voice actress did a bad job, in fact I think she gave a great performance, I just didn't feel like the voice matched up too well. I'm not sure how to describe it, but I think she just came off too young in my opinion. Hey, what's to worry? I'm an X-Man, remember? But overall, I thought the voice work was good, but I think it was stronger overall in the Ultimate Alliance game. But that's all I have for the audio, so let's start to wrap up things in our conclusion section. Citizens of Earth, I am Magneto. I have three demands which must be met unconditionally. First, all anti-mutant programs are to be terminated immediately. Second, the island of Genosha in the Indian Ocean will be granted to me as a sovereign nation. Finally, General William Kincaid will be handed over to me for trial under mutant law. If my demands are met, 
the sun will shine again. If I am defied, the chill you feel now will become the endless winter of your discontent. The choice is yours. Before I get into my final thoughts, I want to discuss how the game was received by the public and how it sold. X-Men Legends 1 was a pretty successful game when it released back in 2004. I wasn't able to find the cost for its development, but it ended up selling around 800,000 copies while earning roughly $28 million in the US over the next couple years. This was clearly enough to greenlight a sequel, which we'll be discussing in a future retrospective. As far as scores, it was reviewed pretty positively with a current Metacritic score of 79 for the PS2. We didn't talk about it yet in this video, but it received a lot of praise for its cel-shaded art style. During an interview with Game Informer, lead designer Keith Fuller describes how the cel-shading look was created. So I, I don't know, So for the longest time people said that Legends was cel-shaded rendering yeah. because they didn't know what else to call it. Uh, and originally it wasn't. It wasn't anything special. We had a 3D environment with 3D models in it, uh, but we had a particularly fantastic artist at the time, Chris Peterson, got to throw his name out. Um, because he basically came up with this just amazingly simple but visually awesome technique of kind of double rendering the character model and the outer shell was flipped around and black and so it just lined the comic. And that's what made people say, oh, it's cell shaded. That's astonishing. Good job to you, Raven Software. And it was really just Chris did this thing over the weekend. We came in on Monday and went, holy crap. And the visual style was kind of just nailed for the remainder of the series, and I guess you still see elements of that. Yeah. Yeah. This was a unique style and worked to emulate the comic book feel, and it's definitely become iconic with the series. But needless to say, X-Men Legends was a successful game and a solid start for Raven Software. As far as my thoughts on the game, throughout this video I've voiced some of the criticisms I have for X-Men Legends, but don't let that fool you into thinking that I don't like this game. I really love it and I think it's a hallmark Marvel game that I wish everyone could experience. It feels kind of dated now, but this was a big game back in 2004. Hell, it's even an important game now when you consider how long it's been since we got a proper X-Men game. We didn't talk much about it, but the X-Men were purposefully excluded from gaming for a while and only just recently started to re-emerge back into games like Ultimate Alliance 3. The reason for their disappearance was due to Fox holding the movie rights to the X-Men, as well as a cut from the merchandising, including games. So Marvel decided to stop making X-Men merchandise and games, instead of just sharing the profits. I imagine that's one of the reasons why we never got an X-Men Legends 3. But with Disney buying out Fox, that's hopefully a thing of the past. Maybe one day we'll be lucky enough to even get a third game like we did with Ultimate Alliance. But as of right now, X-Men Legends is still a game that many fans look back on favorably, and with good reason. Raven Software managed to execute a phenomenal X-Men RPG that made you feel like the X-Men. Each character received a lot of care and attention to detail, and I like how Raven was willing to throw in characters that don't often get the spotlight, characters like Jubilee and Emma Frost. I think the combat is the backbone of the game and it feels really good here. It makes a lot of sense why the core mechanics of the combat were carried over into the sequel and into Ultimate Alliance, because it's just so good. It's even more impressive when you consider that this was Raven Software's first multi-platform game, and how they were not only able to get past the learning curve, but also release such a beloved game. Personally, my favorite aspects about X-Men Legends are the combat and the attention to detail, and what I mean by that is how accurately each X-Men is represented based on the comics. The focus on teamwork was also a great call, and I loved the feeling when a specific character was able to affect the gameplay in a unique way based on their powers. There's so much flexibility in how you build your characters that I think you could replay this game multiple times and try different strategies and builds out, making each run feel like a different experience. That being said, there are areas that I think X-Men Legends struggled with. I think the story was decent for the most part, but it felt so padded that it kind of made things feel repetitive at times, and the level design didn't help with this problem. Not only were the designs of some of the levels not very exciting, but so much of a level looked the same that I found myself getting lost navigating their corridors, especially in the Morlock Tunnels. The minimap helps a lot, but it's still really easy to get turned around if you don't have it up constantly. The AI is also kinda wonky at times, since they'll often block your path and stand in front of doorways. As cool as it is to have control over their behaviors, I do prefer the more automated approach. The voice acting was another area that left me a bit lukewarm. It wasn't bad, but there's definitely room for improvement. None of these things ruined the game for me though, and I still hold it in high regards, but I'm hoping that a lot of these issues are addressed in X-Men Legends too. I will say though, a lot of my criticisms aren't issues in Marvel Ultimate Alliance. 
And I'm really happy that's the case because it means that Raven Software was taking feedback and working to improve upon this foundation in later games. And that's the way it should be. Sequels should always be better than the previous games. I know I compared Ultimate Alliance and X-Men Legends a lot in this video, so I hope I don't sound like I'm saying X-Men Legends should be more like Marvel Ultimate Alliance. What I'm trying to point out is, look how far they've come from where they started, especially considering that they started on such a high point with X-Men Legends 1. Raven Software made something truly special, and I imagine it resonates very deeply with X-Men fans. I really enjoyed my time with X-Men Legends, and it makes me excited to jump right into the sequel. If I had to give X-Men Legends 1 a score out of 10, I'd give it an 8.5. It's a solid game, and I'd recommend anyone give it a try, but I'd especially recommend it if you're an X-Men fan, because I think you'd really get a kick out of the thematic gameplay and all the easter eggs and references. But like I mentioned, next up will be a retrospective on the sequel, X-Men Legends 2. I remember enjoying it a lot as a kid, but it's been so long since I've played it that I don't remember much about it, so I'm really looking forward to revisiting it next. As far as my other plans for retrospectives, I had to delay the Marvel Nemesis video based on technical difficulties, so my current plan is to do X-Men Legends 2, and then hopefully Nemesis after that. Beyond that, I'm open to suggestions on any games that you'd like to see covered for future retrospectives. I'm really enjoying making these retrospectives, and I hope to keep doing them from here on out, but I also want to make sure that I'm discussing topics within them that are interesting to you. So if you like the current format, please let me know, or if you have suggestions for certain categories be added or removed, lengthened or shortened, I'd appreciate that feedback as well. Since these are longer videos, I want to make sure that I'm making the most of it and discussing the areas that you're most interested in hearing about. But those are my current plans so far. In the meantime, if you're interested in other Marvel retrospectives, I have ones for the full Marvel Ultimate Alliance trilogy. I also have a ton of videos on Marvel's Avengers and Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 if you're a fan of those games. If you're interested in Marvel content, I really would recommend checking out the Marvel audiobooks on Audible. I really do use that service myself, and I've been enjoying checking out different Marvel stories on there. Aside from that, you can always join us on Discord to discuss all things Marvel. The link for that is in the description as well. But anyway... Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.